please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Thank you very much, our Elon Moy. And uh, welcome to the closing bell, everybody. As we go and ring the close here, the Dow is going out with a gain of 114 points today. Uh, that puts it at 22,776, a half percent increase there. Uh, the S&P 500 also up half a percent to 2,552. Today, look, everybody's in the green, and this is a theme we've been seeing for several days in a row. In fact, the S&P now up eight days in a row, I believe. Six consecutive all-time highs have been set for the first time since the late 1990s. The Nasdaq up three quarters of one percent today. Even the Russell 2000s up a quarter of one percent to 1512. So record closes for the Dow, the S&P, and the Nasdaq once again. Very much our Elon Moore. And uh, welcome to the closing bell, everybody. As we go and ring the close here, the Dow is going out with a gain of 114 points today. Uh, that puts it at 22,776, a half percent increase there. Uh, the S&P 500 also up half a percent to 2,552. Today, look, everybody's in the green, and this is a theme we've been seeing for several days in a row. In fact, the S&P now up eight days in a row, I believe. Six consecutive all-time highs have been set for the first time since the late 1990s. The Nasdaq up three quarters of one percent today. Even the Russell 2000s up a quarter of 1% to 1512. So record closes for the Dow, the S&P, and the Nasdaq once again today. We are waiting now on earnings from Costco and Young China. We'll bring you those numbers as soon as they are out. And uh, joining me here to talk about these markets, we have CNBC senior markets commentator Michael Santoli, Stephanie Link, who's managing director and equity portfolio manager from TIAA Investments, and Karen Feinerman, president of Metropolitan Capital. Thanks for joining us down here. Happy to join you guys. Fun to be down here. And, and then getting the plum theme going on here as well. We did, yeah. Uh, but anyway, let's begin with this record day for the markets, Michael. And a strong, you know, we've seen some of these that are kind of creeping higher, but yeah. today it was a pretty big leap. Yeah, it went from walking higher every day to jogging today. I mean, it was a half a percent move. It's about twice the uh, the typical pace of this little seven-day win streak. Um, it's, it's hard to really identify something specific that should put a stop to this slow climb, except for the fact that it starts to seem inevitable that it goes up every day. So I think once that sentiment is truly broad out there and we stretch uh, to further highs, maybe that's the time to worry. And then maybe some change of view about what the Fed has to get going here after and, that jobs number. Yeah, by the way, talking the S&P, Netflix was the best performing stock in the sector today. Student loan servicer Navient was the worst. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And the Dow, Goldman led the way as the best performer. United Health, Stephanie, was the worst. What do you make of that? Well, overall, it was like the winners won today, right? It was FANG. They had a great showing, best day since mid-July, and they're up 3.5% since last week's lows, so the old winners were winning. Um, semis continued to do well. Healthcare did well. Financials did well. So we've been talking about this all year long. It's been this rotation every week, every day, and as long as there's enough participants, that's going to keep the market higher until we get earnings. Once we get earnings, then I think you're going to see a separation between sectors and then individual stocks as well. Karen, let's drill down on this Netflix story for just a second. Uh, shares, they were up 5 percent on this news that they're going to hike their fees for users by a dollar. Nobody's grandfathered in, so this will be the case for everybody here. The plan, the traditional HD streaming plan, goes from $9.99 to $10.99 a month. The 4K streaming version, a few more. Basic plan still $7.99. Some market reaction. The shares closed higher by 5.5 percent. What do you make of that? Uh, it makes sense to me. I mean, when I think of Netflix, I think of my use, it is consistent with laziness, my own laziness. And so if my bill goes up by a dollar or two dollars, depending on which plan, I am too lazy to do anything about that. And I think that's the bet that they're going to make. Or And people love the product. So I think this is just big bottom line margin improvement for them as it hits the bottom line. Any sign, I mean, the, the street seems to be taking this as there's no problem in terms of their content. People love it. They're willing to pay up for it. But there's plenty of comp There's never been more competition, Michael. There's never been more competition from others trying to do what Netflix does, I think you could argue. I, I think Netflix has reached a point of seeming like the default option for anything besides the bundle. Uh, and even if you have the bundle, it's become at least indispensable by some people's lights. So, uh, look, 10% bump, really, in, in monthly fees, 5.5% yeah. bump in the stock. That makes sense to me, mostly because pricing power has been integral to the bull story for a very long time. And I don't think there's any reason to think that this is going to cause massive attrition. And it just speaks to their strong content. They feel like they can do it without attrition. And also, they're not raising prices on the basic plan. So maybe they can actually stem the issues with password sharing, right? So that we'll, we'll see if it does. But sure. I think that gives more confidence. And oh, by the way, I think that 
we are starting to feel better about the 60 million sub number for 2018. And if you start getting confidence in pricing power, content, and then earnings, that's pretty powerful. I thought, Karen, it was interesting that Wells Fargo came out and they said they thought the price increase was good for Disney because two years from now, Disney will launch a plan that they think will cost $9.99 a month, so it'll be cheaper. Is that taking this <laughs> speculation a few too many steps ahead? I think so. I mean, I think Disney has some really near-term today issues that obviously have been weighing on the stock. I don't know. If, I mean, I guess if we get back to everybody pricing their product higher, then we get right back into maybe cord cutting at some point or, or, or stream cutting or whatever you want to call it. But we're a ways from there. What about the idea that by Disney taking its content off there, that's a bigger problem for Netflix down the road? Do you think that's going to be the case? It, it has. I, they've defied at every turn, every negative expectation, particularly when they started and got into the content business. I thought, this is a disaster. <laughs> Turns I, out I they're fantastic at it. That was the Lily Hammer. That was the original, original series on Netflix. And I remember thinking, it's okay, but I don't think it's really going anywhere. And it's like, well, it wasn't. There were other series. Anyway, uh, <laughs> student loan servicer Navient was the worst performer in the S&P today. It was down 14% after Pennsylvania's attorney general sued the student loan company for allegedly approving loan for students with a high probability of not being able to repay them. Sounds like subprime. The attorney general telling CNBC the scheme cost student loan holders $4 billion. Navient says the allegations, Michael, are completely unfounded. Yeah, obviously it's, it's pretty tough to kind of make a comment on the merits of the allegations, except to say clearly this is a lender at the bottom tier feeding off of uh, students who don't necessarily have many other options uh, at institutions where there was a pretty decent chance they weren't going to graduate with a degree and have a good shot of paying it back. So it all doesn't look great for Navi. I think the market's verdict on this is uh, it's not going to be that easy to defend across the board. I also wonder where the student loan problem is heading. And this reminds me of it a little bit. So we know there's a trillion plus in student debt outstanding. We have everybody from the home builders like Lennar, I think, coming out and saying, we're going to actually pay down some of your debt if you buy one of our entry level homes, Stephanie. Now, when even when the president was making those remarks about wiping out Puerto Rico's debt the other night, some people are saying, what if student loan debt? Were to be next. I mean, where do you think this whole issue is going? Oh my gosh, uh, this is going to be a debate for for a very long time. This is not an easy solution in any way, shape, or form. With this company in particular, though, not only is they have this issue, but then they decided to make an acquisition that is dilutive to earnings, dilutive to free cash flow. They're going to stop buying back their stock, so they kind of look a little guilty in, in a way, but you know we'll have to see how it all works out. But I don't think the bigger picture goes away anytime soon. Karen? I'm just wondering, I mean, I looked at some of the poor profit education stocks today, and I know that a lot of these loans are backed by the government, but I was surprised. They had really no reaction at all. This is a very big problem. Exactly. And yet they seem to be taking this as an isolated case yes. or somehow not indicative that, that there's going to be a problem for everybody else as well. Mm -hmm. They seem to be an office too. I'm so, very surprised. Yeah, time will tell. Uh, shares of UPS were closing lower today. FedEx a little bit higher actually after reports that Amazon is testing its own delivery service. Uh, the new service would reportedly be aimed at making more of the company's items available for free two-day shipping. It says Amazon is calling the project Seller Flex and has plans to roll it out beginning next year. Uh, this is actually a bit of a turnaround, Mike, for UPS and FedEx. UPS in particular was down a couple of percent yeah, earlier on this. I think people started to think about it a little bit more uh, detail in terms of what actual piece of the business Amazon is going to try to do directly or at least experiment with. Amazon has no interest in recreating the entire infrastructure of, of uh, delivery. Uh, that many thousands of trucks and all the rest of it. I do think the big question to me is how much stress Amazon puts on the entire delivery transportation infrastructure because it demands more immediate uh, delivery and things like that. So is it going to be another tough holiday season? Does it make pricing a little bit tougher for these guys to get? That to me is more interesting than this idea that somehow Amazon is going to be displacing these huge companies. Right, and Karen, I was surprised that you know UPS, FedEx, apparently they say just a single digit percentage of their business is Amazon. I was very surprised. <laughs> yeah, I would have thought it was the bulk of their business. Yeah. Because I had been thinking, you know, why should they build it when they could buy it? And maybe they would want to buy FedEx, which would be an enormous deal. But I was very surprised to see that, too. The U.S. Post Office is, in fact, their biggest customer. A big handler for them. That's true. Stephanie, maybe that means the taxpayer somehow benefits, but I'm not so sure. I don't know. I'm a shareholder of FedEx, and I, and I think that the reaction in the stock today was very telling. I thought it was an absolute buying opportunity when it was down 2% at the open. And that's because Amazon's going after the third party in this particular instance. Um, that, that aren't already using Amazon. So they're just trying to clear out their inventory. And I guess that makes sense from Amazon's point of view, especially in dense markets, especially during peak, to 
offload that stress like you were talking yeah. about. In terms of pricing power, FedEx is raising prices mid-single digits, so is UPS, mid-single digits on a consistent basis. And I do not think, given their capacity, given their wherewithal, given their dominance, that that is going to change. So they do have pricing power. And I wouldn't be surprised one day, one day, if FedEx and UPS has a much smaller percentage of their business with Amazon. Because, by the way, it's not profitable business for them. <laughs> so there's puts and takes. I think these extreme reactions to when Amazon makes an announcement or their speculation has very often been a buying opportunity for a lot of different stocks, and that's why I think you have to dig through it. A little I think deeper. Fred Smith at FedEx uh, reminded people today that 85% of the business is, is business to business. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're not really mostly delivering to your home. That's right. So. And so if UPS that, a little more, but still. right. So as we head into the holiday season, any ramifications then? I don't know. I mean, it, it, did they ramp up capacity enough? I mean, you're going to have bottlenecks? I don't really know. I mean, yeah. that's obviously what Amazon cares about. Peak has always been so hard for these two companies. I always kind of say, you don't really want to own these stocks in the first quarter of the full year because you get the fourth quarter results. But then the rest of the year, it's home free, you know? So honestly, you just have to give, there are puts and takes throughout the year. But I think they're very well positioned. I just want to circle back for a, a moment to the broader markets, which again, we had this tri trifecta again of record closes. Uh, we did see a jump up earlier when they passed the budget resolution out of the out of Congress, Karen, is that setting us up for tax reform? I mean, is it, you could almost say, okay, well, it bought you 60 points on the Dow and that's it. I mean, right. how important is this passage, do you think, overall? I think it, it got them to the starting line. They've had trouble getting to the starting line before in some other issues, so it's good, but of course they had to do that to even get to here. I think, though, that they will get something done, no matter how watered down it is, no matter what they have to give up, whether it's corporate rates, um, whether it's the state uh, and local, tax, uh, local tax deductibility. I think that they need a win, and no matter what it is, even if it's not permanent, they will get something done. Actually, might have some news on this. Uh, Elon Moy joins us from Washington, Elon, with a little bit more on how this process might be moving along. Kelly, the Senate Budget Committee had passed its version of a fiscal 2018 budget. Uh, budget Committee Chairman Mike Enzi saying that this budget is a step toward a brighter future, and now you can expect to see this budget go to the floor of the Senate before the end of October. Also, in some unrelated news from Capitol Hill, we see or seeing that uh, Congressman Tim Murphy has resigned his post effective this afternoon. Uh, House Speaker Paul Ryan reiterated his comments from that press conference here in a statement saying that uh, Tim Murphy's decision to move on to the next chapter of his life was his own and that Speaker Ryan supports that call. Of course, uh, Congressman Murphy uh, stepped down after the reports came out that he had asked his mistress to uh, have an abortion even though he is someone who has been strongly pro-life. So two important and interesting developments there on Capitol Hill, Kelly. Yeah, I'm not going near that. Elon, thank you, uh, guys, except to say this vacancy now will be opened by a Pennsylvania Republican. Um, is there any uh, implication, Michael, in terms of political process? The votes were just talking about. I think about the district is still considered to be a likely Republican hold. So I don't know that it's necessarily going to change the equation very much. But obviously, any another position in play where you're going to have uh, two new contestants. And Stephanie, the broader news, of course, is the Senate Budget Committee approving that budget resolution. It sets in motion what Karen's uh, talking about. What do you think the impact for markets is? I think it's starting to get priced in. I mean, I, I, I listen to you know, a lot of After people. After this record run. <laughs> right? I mean, I really do think it is. Some people say it's not. How could it not be at this point, right? I mean, I know we're all, like, excited about it because it will benefit corporate earnings and that sort of thing and buybacks and repatriation. I think either way, as long as we get some sort of understanding of what's going to happen. If we don't get a good bill, if we get a good bill, either way, we can then start fresh and figure out businesses can spend, businesses can also do M&A. It's having that understanding. Standing, and that's, I think, is so important. And finally, tomorrow morning, Michael, we're going to get the jobs report, which can often set the tone for all of this. Yeah. How strong is the economy? What kind of growth can we get? What can, what can we expect out of Washington? Who's going to be chair of the Fed? Goldman just said they think it might only be a 50,000 yeah. uh, number because of the hurricane impact and other things. So is that still, you know, should we take that at, at face value? Should we just disregard it, wait for the next one? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be unsatisfying for that reason because you're going to be able to have that full range of responses from this means nothing right. to, wow, this might have implications for the economy and the Fed. I don't really think it has. A, by the way, the jobs number has not been a market mover in a very long time. That's true. It's been, That's true. I mean, probably over a year. And if we have that, Karen, we have who's going to fill the Fed chair. I mean, which is more important for you from here? Uh, the Fed chair, because that's, that's a big decision once the jobs thing, you know, we get however many a year of those. The Fed chair thing is, is really important. There are some good candidates, though. Stephanie? 
who do you think? I mean, we've we've got sort of the the Warsh reformer, more hawkish character. We got Yellen, who sounds like she's not even in the running at this point. <laughs> uh, you got a couple of more mid. You know, who do who? It's it's very important, obviously, right? But I mean, I think if at the end of the day, I'm looking at the broader economy. If the economy is improving, if interest rates kind of stay, and even if they gr gradually go higher, but they go higher at a measured pace, and the economy is strong enough to handle that, that's okay. And I think if the global economies are doing well, we're going to be able to handle some changes. There's change coming. There's no doubt about it. And I think it's going to be more hawkish than not. But I think it's going to be at a measured pace. I do believe that. All right. Stay right there, everybody. We have some earnings still to get to. Costco's results are set to be out any moment now. We're going to break down the numbers and discuss whether they can help give this underperforming stock a much needed boost amid increasing competition from Amazon. Plus, we'll hear from one analyst who's making a very bullish call on those old fashioned broadcasters. He thinks they could outperform or she thinks they could outperform the broader market. And we want to hear from you. You can contact the show via Twitter, Facebook or send us an email. Closing bell at NBCUni.com. You're watching CNBC first in business worldwide. Welcome back. Those Costco earnings are out now. Seema Modi has the numbers. Seema? Hi, Kelly. Costco reporting earnings of $2.08. That is higher than what the street was expecting, which was $2.02. Revenue also beating expectations at $42.3 billion. Wall Street was anticipating $41.5 billion. That was the estimate. In terms of comm sales, up 6.1%. We're looking at the stock down right now, uh, nearly 2% here in extended trade. I would point out that the stock is still up for 2017. On the conference call, we'll look for details as to how the hurricanes impacted Costco, if at all, in this current quarter. Plus, of course, how it plans to fend off competition from Amazon. Kelly? Yeah, uh, Seema, thank you. Shares down about two and a quarter percent. Stephanie and Karen are back with us, along with Liz Dunn from Proforma, who is here to react to these earnings. Um, so let's just begin with you. Um, what numbers jump out at you? So the comp number was in line, 6.1 percent for the quarter, 8.9 for September. Probably helped a little bit from the hurricane. We'll see. Have to go understand that a little bit. This company just posted about a 16, 17 percent earnings growth rate beat on revenue. That's a really great number, right? I mean, and it speaks to the business model that they have and the traffic that they're getting into the stores because of the membership that they have. So I would like to have them break out the e-commerce business for the first time. Last month, they actually broke out e-commerce and how much it grew double digits, which was impressive. So I think we just got to get comfortable about their e-commerce strategy and, and where that's going relative to the bigger picture. Liz, I know you're a little bit more cautious on Costco here. Uh, what do you think about this report? Yeah, you know, I haven't really gotten a chance to dig into the report yet, but I think, you know, to Stephanie's point, the e-commerce uh, growth will be important. Membership growth, obviously, always important. I think the September numbers look very strong. But the reason the stock has underperformed year to date is because of the competition that's on the, you know, on the come. Um, you know, you have uh, Amazon acquiring Whole Foods, and I think that that is only in the very early stages of having an impact. And so I, I'm not quite sure what they can say to uh, lessen investors' fear about that phenomenon, but uh, but we'll certainly yeah. be looking for it. Karen, what about you? I mean, I, that, they must feel bad. They put out some pretty good numbers, right? <laughs> right. And this is the thanks they get. I mean, I thought they were pretty good. I don't own it. I've always thought it to be too expensive, which has been short-sighted in my for me because the stock over time has done really well. We'll see how much is hurricane in one time, but I guess it's still, other than Amazon, retailers don't get the multiples they used to, and maybe that's just the thing the way I've gone, despite great earnings. Yeah, I mean, I always say they should rename it, uh, you know, Costco Prime. The membership <laughs> should be called, because that's what it is. They invented Prime. And it kind of inspired Amazon Prime. And it's interesting, you know, to hear Liz say, look, there is this overhang that Amazon Whole Foods can do something, but while there's overlap in the customer profile, I just was under the impression not a lot of overlap in, in product categories. Categories and, and and size and all the all the other type of and things. A small business customer for Costco. That's right? a good point. But also, what about the price, Stephanie? It's, it feels to me like certainly when you go on, when I go on Amazon, I'm not getting a great price. Oh, I'm getting sure. convenience. I'm not getting a great price at Costco. You are undeniably getting a great price. Do you think that can differentiate them in this kind of environment? Still, absolutely. I, I think their product selection, their pricing is absolutely the lowest out there. 
they have the membership fees, they're getting the retention of the memberships. So I think that's really very important. I don't think that goes away overnight. Sure, there's competition. But guess what? This stock just went from 150 to 165. So it's going to pull back. I think you're going to get an opportunity because I do think there are still some winners in this Amazon world. You know, the one thing, Karen, I think is interesting in terms of opportunity, maybe missed opportunity for them is the urban millennial, let's say. You know, that, and I know that trend is changing and they're starting to kind of go to the suburbs and buy those houses and that's probably good for Costco. But while people are in the city centers and want to be, Costco is a hard proposition for them, right? It is, unless it's definitely limited to their e-commerce. You know, if they can really ramp that up, that would be a good thing. But one other point I want to make about the fee increase for the partnership for, uh, for members, that was really accepted very nicely. Maybe speaks to the Netflix. People True. are like, we love it. This, that's fine. We'll yeah. the right. we'll Whatever the it hike. is, it's still, it's still a great value. Liz, uh, do you feel differently, though? I mean, I know you think in this case the Amazon is a worthy competitor with Whole Foods. But, again, to me, it feels like the price that Costco offers, and they're not just a grocery store. I mean, you can almost buy anything from them. Right. Well, I think that's part of my fear is there's no room to, you know, there's no room to give on the margin. And so with gross margins in the low double digits and, and operating margins in the low single digits, there's just nowhere to go. And, and they've got that e-commerce penetration in the mid single digit range. And so if you think about what it's going to take to grow that, they're going to have to invest. And I don't know that there's any margin to give. So you've got Amazon now saying they want to go after grocery aggressively. You've got uh, Walmart having paired up with Jet, and they're saying they want to be more aggressive in grocery. And so it's just, I, I mean, these are fantastic numbers, and we certainly can't take that away from them. I just think that with the stock trading where it is and the expectations heading into this report, it makes it difficult for the stock. It's kind of fighting against itself and fighting against um, the, the negative perceptions out there. All right. Guys, thank you all. Liz Dunn, Karen Feinerman, and Stephanie Link. Very much appreciate it. Uh, we'll have more on Costco earnings on Fast Money tonight, along with Roger McNamee, who says that Facebook is in a whole lot more trouble than you think. That's all starting at the top of next hour. Coming up here, Kansas uh, City Fed President Esther George is about to make some comments at a conference in Austin, Texas. We'll bring you those remarks as soon as they happen. And Amazon's disruption seems to know no bounds. Now they are turning grad school recruiting on its ear. That story is next in our Fast Take.